So now you will be in for a real treat. Now there are two, two things that I remember in particular about our next speaker, which is Don Syme, who's joined us all the way from Microsoft Research in the UK. The first one I learned almost 10 years ago, when I was sitting next to Don on a bus, going to a dinner at TechEd Europe in Barcelona, when he told me that he created generics. It's like, oh yeah, I've heard of those. I'm sure you guys have heard of generics, little, little feature in .NET. The next one, he didn't have to tell me because everybody knows that Don is the creator of F Sharp. So we are very pleased to have Don here, be one of our keynote speakers. And now I'm gonna give it to Don. Okay, am I on, am I on? can you hear me? It's okay, good. Uh, right, thank you very, very much for having me here. Um, Portland, how could I say no to coming to Portland? Uh, I fell in love with this city in 1997. Um, McMenamins are a huge part of me falling in love with it. I went to a youth hostel that they have out in, uh, out to the west and uh, to the east. I always get west and east confused in Portland. I don't know what, what it is. For six months I lived here and I was perpetually confused about directions for some reason. Uh, but it was just the best time of my life ever and I just totally fell in love with this city and its architecture and amazing spaces like this. And um, so, fantastic place to come back to. And uh, the other thing I couldn't turn down was the opportunity to come and talk to this audience at this particular time in the history of .NET. Uh, because I think uh, there's, you know, we're at a, at a changing point around for the whole story about .NET. And the kind of changes that are happening in .NET are, are, are I feel in many ways, F Sharp has kind of walked uh, a path uh, which is, in some ways, can, uh, I hope, provide inspiration for um, some aspects of, of, of the .NET story going, going forward. Uh, Scott Hanselman had on his slides a history of open source uh, at Microsoft. Uh, actually, F Sharp was, uh, was there as well. It wasn't uh, on his slide, it was 2010 that we did the open source release of F Sharp. In some ways, I, I think F Sharp's an, been an interesting thing at Microsoft because we've had to do things a year or two earlier in the F Sharp world, driven by a certain kind of logic in certain different situations. That, and then two years later, to our shock and surprise, the whole of Microsoft then has to kind of go and follow. 2010, we, we did open source in the legal sense of like putting it out under an Apache 2.0 license because we just knew there was very little realistic, we, we, we could sense that to be credible as a language in 2010, in the audiences, in some of the audiences we were particularly talking with in the functional programming communities, you just had to be open source. You just totally had to be. And management kind of knew that. Microsoft wasn't there for that, really. They weren't ready with that. But for F Sharp, they, they, they did it. And now, 2012, TypeScript comes out, and you know, it just has to be open source. And now we're 2015, 2016, .NET, it just the logic is some, it just rolls on, that it ha you, you, to be credible, you've got to be, have certain kind of characteristics, and, and that's not just the language, but the, the whole, uh, now the whole runtime stack as well. Am I bumping? It's okay, it's okay. Uh, right, so there's a point in time for .NET history, and, uh, and, and F Sharp has sort of been uh, an accidental thought leader not only in language design, but it's now become a, a thought leader in, in, in community and, and how we talk about the technologies, how Microsoft contribute to technologies and play and the roles we kind of kind of play. And I know that plays, who listens to the, uh, the .NET podcast by Bertrand Loire? Who listens to the .NET weekly, what's he call it? The .NET, the, 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 the talk about .NET that he does online? On .NET. On .NET. Who listens to that? Okay, we've got a few people. Okay, you should all, you should, there's a great set of topics there to, 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 to go and listen there. And I know Bertrand has been influenced that he wants, through on .NET, he wants to start to give voices to the, F -sharp, to the, to the .NET community uh, more than just the, the sort of the voice that comes from, from Microsoft itself. What 
this, what it's, what's that noise? I'm not getting a lot of feedback as I move around. Just a sensitive, okay. Right, so I'm going to give a variation of a talk I've been given, giving, which is about the entire F sharp journey and how it's, uh, it's really been this story of um, resolving tensions and the act of resolving certain, what seem like irreconcilable things leads to uh, happiness and leads to a sense of uh, uh, sort of uh, things no longer, things that used to be a big, big problem suddenly disappearing and be not being a problem and becoming a source of, of relaxation and happiness. So to help me relax, I didn't bring a Hawaiian shirt, which I should probably have done, so to help me relax, I've got myself a beer at the, at the back. Uh, okay, and, and this, this theme um, is, is true for both aspects of language design and, 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 and community and delivery and open source and the like. So uh, I guess I've always taken a position in my work that uh, we should be, you know, when we see things that look ir irreconcilable, let's just take one back from history a bit, objects and functional, okay? These were totally separate irreconcilable camps. I'll be talking about it a bit longer, but just to give you the sort of space about what I mean about irreconcilability, that we should, we should start with those as, as, as something to, to struggle with. We shouldn't just take a side and just like shout at each other like we see so many of our politicians doing these days. We, we should really work with it. You know, what, can we, what can we do with, uh, to, to, to find a, a synthesis from that? So these great disputes should be sort of struggled with. now. Uh, so this is not a new idea that out of the irreconcilable ideas, how many people sort of know this stuff? It's like co Communist Manifesto sort of territory or uh, <coughs> Engels and, uh, and, 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 and Marx and um, Hegel and the like. That, yeah, the whole philosophies are built on this idea that out of these uh, irreconcilable contradictions, we should be able to find some kind of synthesis and through that syn syn synthesis, we should be able to, to form change. Uh, it is, yeah, the entire philosophies are built on this as the realization of, of the, you know, the, the, out of this will come some perfect universe. Uh, and uh, you could perhaps take this a little bit, oh no, first, uh, so what, what, what do we get out of this and what do I mean by relaxation? I thought I'd, I'm living in London now, so I thought I had to remind myself of London and what relaxation means. This is Hyde Park in London. And... Uh, that's what we're, that's, that we're, we're when, when, when the communists say synthesis, I actually think about li sitting around in Hyde Park and uh, looking at the wonders of the British Parliament and its stability and its... Uh... Okay, okay, yeah. Good, okay, I can do this. Uh, thanks. Uh, okay, so you can take the whole idea of synthesis too far. Thomas Petracek said to me, oh, you're giving a talk on synthesis, and uh, uh, then you have to talk about mustard watches. Mustard watches, this was his thing. This is a famous, uh, famous paper, famous French paper, introducing an integrated approach to time and food, this, taking this idea of synthesis, that you, you know, time and food are obviously irreconcilable tensions, and that naturally leads to a certain resolution of that. So you can, be, you can take this stuff too far, some things aren't actually intention, some things are actually orthogonal and there's nothing to be found in their, in their resolution. But uh, we, we want to do better, th better than that. So I want to take you through two language design topics uh, uh, and then flick through a bunch of others and then talk about the, uh, the, the sort of more community and social kind of tensions and resolutions in the F-sharp space. And I just want, this is like going right back to the start of F-sharp about your people ask me why did I do F sharp, it kind of starts with this. I love functional programming. We land in a world of .NET, which is all about language interoperability. There were, we started up a, a range of projects to bring languages onto the .NET platform. Uh, we, there were efforts very early on, back in 1998 and 99, to bring Perl and Python and a whole bunch of uh, language called Mercury. I don't know if you've ever heard of that one. Uh, but, but a whole range of, it's a sort of variation on Prolog. Uh, stuff and bring it to uh, the, the, the .NET 
uh, ecosystem. And I was a huge lover of functional programming from the OCaml programming language history, but also in the Haskell world. And we wanted to, we, the, yeah, people thought these things were, were ir irreconcilable back then. And even to some extent today, functional languages were, in some cases, isolated. They weren't interoperable, you know. They had, often because they had their own VM stack, it still will apply to Haskell and OCaml, for example, today. All the interop standards that were around back then, it, does anyone have anything to do with Corba in their working life today? There's always one. <laughs> hey, now this audience is big enough, you've got four. I, what's wrong with America, man? <sighs> Okay, so Corba, yeah, that, 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 it, you know, I, don't, I never even really understood what it was. Uh, and it, it, it certainly wasn't good for language integration level interoperability. They, they had some other things that were going for it. Uh, okay, and, and we needed to solve this, and so the F-sharp approach, which was also the approach uh, so, so concomitantly taken by Scala, and now also you see it very much in the approach being used by Swift and a whole range of other languages, is actually not to snub our noses at those industry standard runtime layers. There were so many people who said, you'll never ever get uh, a functional language to run fast on one of those object-oriented garbage collectors because they're all tuned all incorrectly. And I still see paper after paper with that statement of belief that functional programming has fundamentally different garbage collection tuning characteristics to object-oriented programming. They don't take that as a point like, oh, well, maybe we could just like do a little bit of machine learning or a little bit of inference to work out, oh, we're running a functional program, we'll use these settings, and we're running an object-oriented one, we use these settings. I mean, there's, you can solve that problem, right? But people were so divided, so snubbing their nose at the object-oriented world or vice versa, that there was no synthesis being found between these worlds. And uh, or it wasn't in this tension, I'll talk more about functional and OO, this was really a tension between sort of academic language implementations and industry language implementations and uh, their belief that they couldn't serve, uh, there was no synthesis to be found there. Uh, there's, in part of this, we also took the approach of trying to influence these runtime systems through the design of generics. The design of generics was definitely done not just to support uh, C-sharp or cool, as it was once called. Anyway, it was, uh, it was also done to support Java-like languages or, or uh, Eiffel-like languages or ML or uh, F-sharp class of languages or, or Scala class of languages. Uh, there's a, in this kind of approach, uh, there's a tricky tension about how close the language gets to the runtime system. With F-sharp, we always designed it as a .NET language. A language like Clojure is a little bit more I independent uh, of, of those different runtime layers, though it comes through in lots of other uh, aspects. There's going to be a talk on Clojure.NET tomorrow, I think. Uh, Scala is very much embracing the JVM system, and the Swift is very much embracing the sort of IOR, Objective-C runtime system. And perhaps most significantly is we're willing to redesign languages with interop in mind. You know, just, uh, there's quite a, you know, we could go through the F-sharp language specification and highlight out the parts where interoperability is built into the language design, and there'll be quite a lot of places all the way through where that's done. Okay, so that, that was the F-sharp approach, and it absolutely worked. Uh, it's a, as I said, it's followed by Scala and Swift, and we've, functional programming languages are way more interoperable while definitely staying true to functional programming principles and keeping the core of, of, of what we value in the functional first approach. And just to say, the, the whole agenda of interoperability led, yeah, one of the great things about finding a synthesis is it can open up whole new areas of, 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 of thinking about problems. And the focus on interoperability is definitely part of the background to what led to this F-sharp type provider work which, which takes the notion of interoperability to a whole new level. Uh, and I'll, 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 I'll talk about that. Some tensions do remain. There are some functional techniques that can't be so easily implemented on industry standard VMs. Uh, so for instance, higher kinded types is something in, in, in the, from the Haskell world, uh, which uh, you have to take various trade-offs, uh, which we'd rather avoid. Okay. Uh, the next language design topic I'll talk about briefly is functional and, and objects. Uh, again, wow, back then, back in the day, 
these, these functional and uh, OO languages are really, really opposed to each other. Okay, you still in some functional language circles, I gave a talk at a, this, a variation of this talk at a conference called Compose in New York. This slide, the mention of functional and objects in the same sentence, did provoke the uh reaction from some of the, the audience, okay? Uh, and that's how it is. And I love this one. You've probably read it already. The book, Modern Compiler Implementation and Standard ML by, by Appel. Great book. Got a chapter on object-oriented programming where it defines every other chapter has a little subtitle in it, like garbage, you know, something that needs to be cleaned up or something like this, okay? And the object-oriented chapter has that as the little tagline. Nothing else in the whole book saying anything against object-oriented programming, but yeah, he, he's a functional programmer and he just wanted to put in that he was not happy uh, with, with, uh, with object, <laughs> object orientation. Uh, okay, the F sharp and objects, uh, we, we, you know, we did the work and we sketched it out. It's got this lovely property that you can just have this this let binding in the middle of your class is the class definition in F-sharp. You have some inputs up here, you have some object internals, and you have some exported properties and methods. Uh, very simple, and it's great, because these let bindings here, your functional programming core, they can include functions and all sorts of other st stuff. And uh, you can move them from the top level and into the class and into your expressions, and it's just like, as I say, you're refactoring your code by tabbing it in and out. And it's a, it's a really beautiful property of the F-sharp object-oriented system. There's the core constructs in object orientation. It's interesting, when we did the design in F-sharp, we started with object expressions, which allow you to implement an interface in an expression form. Uh, because F-sharp was a functional first expression-oriented language, we start with this one, and then eventually we added the rest as we decided how we wanted it to be. Uh, it's interesting because this is a feature here that C-sharp still doesn't have and as far as I know there's no, it's not even on the radar of the C-sharp team, but it's immensely useful. I had to do some C-sharp programming the other day and it was so frustrating not to be able to just put in an implementation of an interface as an expression. You had to go put a class and all those fields and uh, you know, manually closure convert the thing and it, it, uh, not a happy experience. So, but in the F-sharp approach this is what we started with and then the rest, the rest followed. Okay, so the F-sharp approach was to embrace objects, make them fit, and with the expression-oriented paradigm. Uh, did it initially largely for interop, but also, you know, we embrace uh, object orientation for software engineering purposes, but not quite the full, we, we, we say we embrace object programming where it's useful. We don't say we're fully object-oriented. What does that mean in practice? A whole bunch of micro features you might think of as coming from the object space, such as subtyping or the use of void or all the way through dot notation and so on. A whole bunch of features you think of as being in more functional. For instance, uh, a function taking multiple arguments is just the same as taking a tuple, or uh, you can use a function as a first class value, or you can uh, have Hindley Milner type inference. And nearly everything can be resolved. In some corners down here, there are some things where there's still some tension. Uh, uh, for example, you need type annotations to make type inference go through. Or if you use method overloading with uh, first class function values, you need to, might need some type annotations. But that's not too ex unexpected. There are some cases like carrying with method overloading, which we just say no. Yeah, we don't do that, don't do that combination. So just, just yeah, that's, that's just too much. Okay. Uh, so, uh, a functional first approach does make a huge difference in practice. So, it's, as we added object orientation, we wanted to make sure that we kept the value of the functional first approach in the, in the language. And so, um, so, we still see this sort of statistic coming through. This is Simon Cousins, you can read about it, look for does the uh, paradigm you use make a difference revisited? Uh, and so this is comparing a, re, uh, a, a, a simultaneous implementation of a system in C-sharp and F-sharp. There were some cultural differences between these teams. Uh, C-sharp project took about five years with eight devs. The F-sharp project was smaller, tighter team, uh, and uh, implemented more, more contracts. Uh, some stats here on this comparison point. Braces, 56,000 braces in C-sharp code, uh, which, <laughs> okay. Uh, comments, well, we have to a lot of comments. We have test code in, in both of them. Uh, but perhaps this one statistic which is particularly interesting is the number of try-catch statements. 
Uh, this is 2000 in the C sharp code versus, no, I think, 9 in the F sharp code. Something had gone chronically wrong with this C sharp project where they needed to, uh, I don't know, every bit of code, they, they, they you know, started panicking about runtime exceptions and started putting every commit had a try catch around it. Uh, and uh, Simon has a, I probably got this thing about relaxation from him, he, offered, he kind of tweets, system deployed to production, off, off for the weekend, uh, you know, um, uh, not expecting any bugs or something like that. He, he, I mean, this is obviously the case that, it's obviously the case that F -sharp code has bugs. Simon's a very, very good software developer. Uh, and, and, and does a lot of testing, but he, he, he prides himself in having very, very few bugs in deployed systems. How long have I got? What? <laughs> okay. Okay, I, well, I'm going to take five minutes extra because there's stuff I need to say. Okay, now this is where I skip because there's a whole bunch of other language areas where we also do this kind of synthesis thing. I don't have any details on these just to say they, uh, the, the same story of synthesis goes through those things. But now I want to talk about cultural and community themes, at, and I am going to take five minutes extra. Uh, thanks. Okay, so it's not just about language design, it's also about, uh, about, about community cultural issues. So just to say quickly where we are with F Sharp, F Sharp is open, cross-platform, neutral, and independent. We accept contributions. We have an, uh, the F Sharp Software Foundation, F Sharp.org. Uh, Xamarin gives us tooling on Android and iOS. We have the Visual F Sharp tools, uh, Microsoft's tools for Windows and Azure. We have all this great stuff on Linux and OSS, Debian.NET Core, Docker, Suave, and so on. And we have this great thing called the F Sharp compiler, uh, compiler services. And the F Sharp community has this strong, self empowered voice. And all of this. The existence of the F-Sharp Software Foundation and this kind of setup has allowed me to be much more relaxed and get on with doing F-Sharp 4.1. We have a language design process, we have RFCs, you're welcome to just go and look, at, look for those. We've done F-Sharp 4.0 and I'm, we're finalizing F-Sharp 4.1. And we have this compiler service and the compiler service, I'll flick through these, I was, I was only planning to flick through these so nothing lost. We have the F-Sharp Power Tools, we have F-Sharp the JavaScript, we have F-Sharp running on Android. We have a great set web programming framework. We love to interoperate with .NET stuff such as Acker.net. Okay, yay. Uh, we have uh, F -sharp, uh, more F-Sharp oriented points of view on uh, dependency management and build. We've heard about that. And we even have this sort of embrace the cloud for distribution. And we've got Docker, and we've got iPad. Okay, all over the place. We've got great stuff and F-Sharp CLR. And things like the compiler service allow the community to go push F Sharp support up into things like coding game. Okay, great. So that's just all awesome because compared to where we were three years ago with F Sharp, we've, we've kept the key thing. We've squared the, squared the circle. We've found the synthesis between enterprise and openness. Enterprise quality, openness, community tooling, ecosystem, and an evolution path for the language. And this is just fantastic from my point of view and from the F-Sharp community's point of view. The other tension I want to uh, talk about today is about dependence and uh, independence. And this is, a, this is, I think, a fascinating thing for .NET at the moment. And I want to go back to this moment uh, where we decided to go down this open path for F-Sharp. And it's a path which Microsoft has not just be legally open, but to actually be open, to be culturally open, to do open engineering and so on. And I want to, it's back to about 2013, 2014, and it happened here in this little cafe. Great things start in, 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 in cafes, it's in, in Cambridge, with, uh, with uh, Phil Trawford and Thomas Petracek. And we realized, yeah, we have a problem. Uh, you know, we, um, we what, what, what's a synthesis? What sort of problem do we have? Or what, where do we want the solution to be? I think .NET is at a similar kind of juncture. We need the audience here to be really stopping and thinking, where do we want .NET to be? And it's not just technical, it's the social, social solutions as well. I want to run through some of the principles as I see it when Thomas and Phil, with, with me uh, contributing as well, talked about founding the F Sharp Software Foundation. Okay, principles, I'll run through these. An open, worldwide, free membership 
with a very sort of social media focus on what the organization would be. We, know, we all know organizations like change.org or 38 degrees or get up or those sort of things. We wanted it to be like that, okay? Uh, uh, and, and, and an education focus as well. So our belief going into this was that every base technology needs a social organization that acts in the interests of that base technology and nothing else. I, our belief was, and F Sharp experiences this more than .NET, but .NET does experience it as well, is that companies today struggle to provide a voice strong enough for a base technology. They can contribute, they can contribute hugely, but they won't succeed alone. We said we needed to shift F Sharp where we wanted it to be. We needed to embrace both commercial and non-commercial. We had to be a demilitarized zone between that for, non -com for commercial interests. We needed to solve our weaknesses, cross-platform and open source. If we're not perfect, we've got to work on it. Painful, but we're going to do it. And there was a sense that being self-consistent with F Sharp and its community, with an empowered user base, might be better, more valuable than trying to work, than, than, than sheer size. Okay, there's a power that comes from inherent self-consistency in a community. And a key thing we've worked on is this concept, which is a new term, term I'm making up, but it's a key concept which you need to work on for .NET and you need to work on it for C Sharp. Okay, and this is this concept of mimetic independence. When a technology, when you can have a conversation with someone about what is C Sharp, what is F Sharp, what is .NET, independent of other technologies, associations, or vested interests. Okay, so does Visual Basic have mimetic independence? Can you talk about it independently of Microsoft? No chance. Independently of, of VBA and explain it. Can you explain it? At the moment, you can't. Does F Sharp have it? Yes, you can. You look at how it's, uh, memes on Hacker News, you can see that it is, that it's, it's partial, definitely. It still has strong associations with Microsoft and, dot, and, and other technologies, but it's achieving a level of mimetic independence. Do .NET and C Sharp have it? That's your challenge, okay? How to make those ideas spread independently of a whole range of things. Okay, so here's some warning signs. Does searching for .NET, C Sharp, F Sharp lead you straight to one company? It shouldn't. It, some of the time, yes, that's fine, but not always. Does your first sentence in explaining .NET begin, oh, it's a Java clone? Bad news, you've got to find language to make this thing spread independently of I its relationship to, to that, or to Windows, or to Microsoft, or to Visual Studio. Okay. Are all the major community contributors from MVPs from one company? I love the MVP program, but it can be over-dominant. It shouldn't be everyone, okay? We have to be broader. Make sure people aren't giving talks and attending just with Windows and Visual Studio. When you have upstack frameworks, languages, and creative tooling, do what they're doing at .NET Fringe. Encourage those, don't extinguish them. And when the community are unkind or unwelcoming, don't do that, amplify lots and lots of positivity. That's a great thing. So the great challenge for .NET, C Sharp, and F Sharp is to, is to get this magic combination to square this circle. Social independence, mimetic independence, not complete independence. Of course, Microsoft are massive, uh, uh, massive contributors to the .NET ecosystem. But we, there are so many vested interests in .NET around the world. We, have, uh, we were computing it before, perhaps half a trillion dollars of GDP uses .NET uh, each year, uh, is built in the context of .NET software development. And <clears throat> that deserves, uh, uh, those voices deserve to be heard and that deserves to be, now we're cross-platform and open source, uh, .NET and C Sharp deserve to spread absolutely everywhere. Uh, okay, so in conclusion, synthesis from contradiction is the heart of what we do in all sorts of ways, lots of different opposites, and when we achieve it, it's a, it's a great world. Thanks. <laughs>